So to introduce myself, um, my name is Anik. I have worked at the Brain Foundation for three years and I'll be your host tonight. Um, I am the grants program manager and digital lead, which means that I oversee the grant application process um, and coordinate with our scientific advisory committee to get all the research grant applications marked. Um, I also write a lot of the content for the Brain Foundation and our division, Migraine Headache Australia. Uh, we also have Carl Cincinnato moderating tonight, so you will see him in the chat um, as moderator Brain Foundation. So for those of you who are new or who don't know much about the Brain Foundation, um, here's just a bit about what we do. Our mission here is threefold. So our primary goal is to fund the highest quality Australian research into, into brain diseases, uh, disorders and injuries. Um, and this research can help improve diagnoses, treatments and patient outcomes overall. Um, and the Brain Foundation was actually established in 1970. So we've been doing this for 53 years now. Secondly, we provide medically reviewed resources about brain conditions that anyone can use to learn about a particular disorder. Um, this includes articles on our website and also content like this webinar or the videos that we'll be releasing throughout Brain Awareness Week. Um, lastly, we raise awareness about the impact of brain diseases and advocate for patients. And this is a really important part of our mission and one of the reasons that Brain Awareness Week exists. Um, because without people being aware of the impact of brain diseases um, on Australians, their loved ones, the medical system, um, it's really hard to get support for research. And that exists at both the general public and also importantly um, at a government level as well. Um, so advocacy is a really important part of what we do. Um, so just before, just to make sure that everyone's in the right place, who is this webinar for? If you are interested in learning about how to improve your brain health, um, if you want to understand more about dementia, and also if you want to ask questions to a brain researcher um, about the link between health, lifestyle factors and dementia, um, or any other questions about brain health and the ageing brain as well. Um, so I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight, who is Associate Professor Greg Sutherland. Um, Greg is the director of the New South Wales Brain Tissue Resource Centre and an associate professor of pathology at the University of Sydney. Um, and the Brain Tissue Resource Centre is actually a brain bank, which means that you can register to donate your brain after death. Um, and this is a really important part of medical research um, and helps enable a lot of um, really groundbreak groundbreaking um, research projects. Um, uh, Greg also leads the Brain and Body Research Node, um, which aims to understand the relationship between the brain and systemic chronic disorders. So that includes things like obesity and diabetes. And so basically they work to understand um, how whole body health and brain health affect each other. Um, Greg's research interests include neuropathology, which is the study of diseases affecting the nervous system, uh, transcriptomics, which is the study of DNA, and the genetic epidemiology of neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so epidemiology is the study of how often diseases occur in different groups of people and also why those people get those diseases. So without any further ado, let's start the webinar. Hello, um, welcome to a talk on brain health and aging as part of Brain Awareness Week in 2023. Uh, my name is Greg Sutherland. I'm Associate Professor of Neuropathology at the University of Sydney, um, and I work in this building here, uh, the Charles Perkins Centre. What we're going to talk about today is um, brain health, uh, what, it, what it means, um, and particularly the relationship of healthy uh, brain, brain ageing and how that is, is distinguished from uh, dementia. Uh, which is the common is form of, of disease that we see associated with the uh, with brain. I'd also like to talk a little bit about uh, busting some some myths about what might and might not cause dementia. Talk a little bit about my dementia research, and then give a few um, basic healthy brain tips to finish off. I'm sure you agree that there's a lot of conflicting information out there about um, how you can defy the odds and have a healthy brain right up to um, the end of your end of your life, and in particular avoid things like dementia. 
um, this is some stories taken from um, Neuroscience News uh, web, website. And there's a couple of uh, suggestions. One of them that does sleep medications, uh, the likes of Stillnox and Christian Charles of Dementia. And, and over here, we've got one talking about poor oral health and how that might contribute to, to dementia. As it turns out, neither of uh, these um, suggestions is um, a major factor, uh, at least in my opinion, on what causes dementia. But they're both quite interesting things to, to follow up because they may give us clues about what are uh, important um, mechanisms because they have some sort of modifying effect on those mechanisms. So the human brain is absolutely unique. For our size relative to even large animals, our brain um, is, a, is immense. Um, and particularly one part of our brain called the, called the forebrain. If you look down here at our, our friend, uh, the mouse who's used in, in the majority of uh, animal model experiments that we do in uh, medical research, uh, they've got a very small uh, frontal, frontal lobe whereas it's large in humans. It's so large uh, that it has needs to be folded up on itself. And you can see these folds here. This is a fixed brain taken from someone after death. And these folds are called gyri, and they're separated by these spaces. It just allows a lot more uh, brain for the amount of space. And the average uh, size of a human brain is about one and a half kgs uh, compared with say a sheep brain you're looking at 400 grams or only a quarter of the size and all the way down to a tenth of that size of 40 milligrams for a mouse for a mouse brain within the brain uh, at a microscopic level there's a number of different brain cells the ones we you typically will hear about are the neurons and these are the ones we often concentrate on when we think about diseases but there are a lot of other cells, oligodendrocytes, for example, they have the myelin with, within them um, that is responsible for insulating um, axons or neurites or parts of the neuron where information travels up and down and they allow that to travel faster. Astrocytes are supporting cells and they do a lot of mopping up of neurochemicals and getting them back to, to the neurons, but have a lot of other um, roles that some of them we don't quite un understand. And there's also these cells called microglia. Um, these are immune cells or the brain's resident immune cells. And as we'll see with, with dementia, a lot of the gene uh, variants that have been associated with de de dementia are actually the, the protein products of those genes are, are expressed in microglia. So the biology of microglia is becoming more and more central to understanding um, dementia and um, Alzheimer's disease, and it's something that my lab works on. Now, in the preceding schematic, we were able to see a lot of space uh, around these cells in the brain, but that is purely a schem schematic. In reality, the processes of cells like neurons in blue, uh, oligodendrocytes, uh, in red, and I beg your pardon, astrocytes in red, and also microglia in green, their processes uh, are not only uh, tightly woven uh, within each other, but also uh, communicating. And so that space between the cells, or well, that open space between the cells in reality doesn't exist. It's just this a bird's nest of processes within the, within the human, human brain. And on the right-hand side, in red, we have something that occurs in Alzheimer's disease brains called plaques. And when you throw in pathology into the mix and the situation becomes even more complex. In green here, we're looking at those immune cells of the brain called microglia. You notice they've got quite a distinct shape to what's shown over on the left. They're reacting to this particular plaque um, in, a, in a quite sort of chaotic, chaotic fashion. And it's this type of scenario that uh, a lot of my research is focused on trying to understand how and why cells uh, respond and whether we can either, if it's good response, attempt, aug augment it, or if it's a bad response, try and stop it or slow it down. So what is brain health? 
Well, brain health, um, and particularly aging brain health, is, is to have no serious injury or disease affecting your brain over your lifespan. Brain health can sometimes be just thought of as whole body health. We're starting to understand that many uh, diseases that we thought were just associated with the brain have a, a whole body aspect uh, to them, although there are other diseases that seem to just uh, affect the brain. So brain health is really a situation where you avoid the causes of an unhealthy brain. If you can avoid them, we would talk about factors being modifiable. Um, uh, but there's other factors that you can't avoid, uh, like, your, like your own genetics. But some examples of, of causes of brain disease that you might be able to avoid or include infectious causes. Uh, this is a disease called Kreutzfeldt-Jakob uh, disease. It would be quite difficult to avoid that. Immunologically, similarly, a disease called multiple sclerosis, um, cells, uh, lymphocytes cross into the, into the brain and cause problems with the white matter. Uh, vascular, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about today. It's also known as uh, strokes, uh, traumatic uh, so head injuries or repetitive head injuries, uh, neoplastic gliomas, major problem for the cancer world because the success rate is of treating gliomas has been has has not improved over a number of years. Um, metabolic toxic um, alcohol being the most commonly used and abused drug, um, and something that my lab also works on the how the alcohol affects the brain. Degenerative, uh, the dementias that we're going to talk about today, and demyelinative. Notice that this is the same disease, multiple sclerosis, as the immunological um, group. Uh, but what happens in multiple sclerosis, as I said, is those lymphocytes cross the blood brain barrier and start attacking the white matter uh, or demyelination. So multiple sclerosis fits both of those, both of those um, categories. Of the, two, of the leading causes of death in Australia, two out of four actually affect the brain. Dementia, including Alzheimer's disease, and cerebrovascular disease or stroke. Coronary heart disease for men and women from when statistics began um, in the earlier 20th century has always been the number one killer in, in Australia and most Western countries. But in the last set of statistics in 2020, it was the first time, at least for females, where coronary heart disease was displaced from the top category and replaced by dementia. And for most of you, this and for me, this came as a should come as a surprise because we usually think of dementia as just affecting a the aged population and maybe not being that common. But as it turns out, with an increasingly older population in Australia and most countries in the world, dementia is almost reaching epidemic um, proportions. Um, these statistics might change a little bit in the next iteration because of COVID, but in general, um, brain diseases, chronic brain diseases, dementia and stroke or, or cerebrovascular disease are two of the biggest uh, causes of death in Australia. The risk factors for stroke and the risk factors for dementia overlap to some degree. Both of them share Made the major risk factor is aging. And as I just said, we have an aging population, so both of these diseases are on the increase. Other factors that cause or increase your chances of having a stroke are very much the same as what increases your chances of coronary artery disease or coronary heart disease or just heart disease because they, the etiology or what causes a disease is common between both of these types of um, problems. In fact, things like buildup of fatty streaks or what we call atherosclerosis in your blood vessels. And so cigarette smoke, smoking or high cholesterol levels or uncontrolled blood, high blood pressure are both problematic for heart disease but also for a um, stroke. 
And I'll point out here also that some of those same associations exist for, for dementia and particularly Alzheimer's disease. And age is, again, the major factor for Alzheimer's disease. Now, why I've talked about probable associations uh, here is, is that the, the one aspect, the evidence for these cardiovascular risk factors is, is, is pretty strong. Um, but it also is because there is a, a reasonably high percentage of Alzheimer's disease cases that also have vascular um, problems, which probably add um, collectively to people becoming demented or losing their cognitive abilities. The other thing I wanted to quickly point out on the risk factors for AD is that your genetics, and particularly a type of gene variant in a, in a protein called apolipoprotein E, the E4 variant of that gene, is a major, the second major problem or the second major cause of Alzheimer's disease after, after aging. So someone who's old and has two copies of this particular gene and therefore two copies of the protein, they are at a much higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease in their lifetime than people who don't have this particular gene, gene variant. I'll return to that subject a, a, little, bit, a little bit later. There's a lot of research that's been happening in, in brain aging. Um, there seems to be different aging processes going on in different organs, whether it's your skin or your gut or your liver, or in fact, your, your brain. They seem to all age at a different speed, but also within individuals, organs and individuals age at different, at different rates. And you would be familiar with this this idea of biological ageing versus chronological ageing, and some people being appearing um, biologically younger than their chronological age. And there seems to be some evidence that that is indeed the case. Um, and, in, and some people's brains uh, look older than would, would, would be expected. And this is mostly associated with some of those risk factors like smoking, and some of those cardiovascular risk factors I talked about before in is the evidence shown by these particular researchers. We know with ageing that there are a lot of changes within the, within the brain, including within the blood vessels. And we also know that the brain gets smaller or loses volume, atrophies with ageing. That happens in both males and females at about the same rate. And we also know, and... Um, opposite to what was originally thought, that we age because we lose neurons or those cells that uh, send signals between them when we uh, think or when we want to make a movement or feel something um, via uh, touch, touch or one of our other senses. Rather than it being loss of neurons, it actually appears to be loss of white matter, that insulating material or myelin that we talk, talked about a little bit earlier. When it comes to neurons, some of the neurons seem to shrink, but we don't lose many neurons with ageing. Yet, the combination of that white matter loss and a little bit of shrinking of neurons is enough to give us some degree of cognitive decline as we age. I'm mentioning ageing because when it comes to dementia, this, as you might have um, already thought from my previous comments, is the, the rate of or the prevalence of dementia at different ages goes up quite rapidly. So it's very unusual for people under 60 years of age to get dementia. But by the time people are 85 years of age and the average longevity for both men and women or combined in Australia is currently around about 82 or 83, by the time people reach 85 years of age, about 25% of that age group over 85 will develop dementia. So that's getting to quite a high, high level. Why do sometimes we use the term dementia and other times use the term Alzheimer's disease? Well, Alzheimer's disease is a type of dementia, but it's also the most common type. There's various um, statistics out there, but probably about 60 to 70% of all dementias are Alzheimer's disease, or at least mainly Alzheimer's disease. Because if you look down here, you'll notice also that there's a mixed type of dementia where there's a combination of what we typically see in Alzheimer's disease, but also with vascular damage. 
And as I mentioned earlier, some of the reasons why having good vascular health and avoiding things like um, uncontrolled um, high blood pressure um, is because, and it, it can prevent dementia because it mainly has the effect on this vascular um, component of the disease. There may be some uh, lesser effects on the, on the Alzheimer's uh, disease, but it probably is mainly through keeping your cerebral vasculature very healthy. These are the hallmark pathologies of AED that we see if we look down the microscope in someone who is demented during their life and died of Alzheimer's disease. We only come to a conclusion they had Alzheimer's disease by looking at these entities um, at post-mortem. Post and what we're looking at here is plaques, which are made up of a substance, a sticky substance called beta amyloid, tangles, which are equally made up of a sticky substance, but this time it's a substance called a protein called tau. And then these two things can sometimes come together either with tangles and plaques and sometimes also tangles right within the, within the plaques. Um, when an individual comes through to post-mortem and we see large amounts of these, um, then they are declared to have Alzheimer's disease. But, a, but an important point is that it's not people with Alzheimer's, not only people with Alzheimer's disease that develop plaques and tangles. As we age, the majority of us will develop plaques and almost all of us Will develop tangles. So there's a real difficulty here in, dis, dis, differ, in distinguishing the effects of a, a natural aging and the effects of Alzheimer's disease. And that makes our usual experimental paradigm of cases versus controls to try to understand what are the factors affecting the diseased community as opposed to people who don't develop dementia. It makes it extremely hard. Indeed, making a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is a probabilistic diagnosis because people who dement get more plaques and more tangles across more of their brain than someone who does not dement. So why do certain, does that happen to certain people? Well, we actually do not know. I talked about this genetic um, variant called apolipoprotein E. There's also other genes that we know, and some of those are those genes are their proteins are expressed in microglia. Diabetes it has a small amount of effect, so does uh, being a female. But the biggest effect on, on whether you um, develop Alzheimer's disease is whether you live to a to a ripe old age. So aging is very inherent uh, to why people develop the disease. There's some large gene effects. There's some protective effects like being highly educated or being a male. But in general, there's a lot of factors that we still don't understand. Some of the myths around um, what will cause dementia um, arise, not so much as myths, but some small studies, and they often are small studies, where someone comes up with an idea that a particular habit uh, might increase your risk for Alzheimer's disease. In this case, um, it's slightly tongue-in-cheek with nose picking, but what they're making the association is between bacteria that might be found in your, in your nose and that your nose is quite close to your brain. It's separated at one stage by quite a thin bony plate which has actually got many holes in it, which allows your olfactory nerves to travel through, but that's very close to the brain. And the thought being, is it possible that some bacteria can get across and into uh, the brain and cause Alzheimer's disease and also other diseases like Parkinson's disease? This is known as the infectious hypothesis, hypothesis for Alzheimer's disease. It's been around in various forms over a long period of time. It may have some uh, it may modify your risk slightly, but it's probably not the major reason why someone um, gets Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia. 
We recently took advantage of a massive new study that's in the UK. It's called the UK Biobank, where they took 500,000 people and measured everything they possibly could on these people, including doing a lot of survey data. They checked their cognitive function. They imaged them in, in um, MRI scanners. And with all of that information and with a few people, because these are aged individuals, having already converted to AD, we tried to work out what was the difference between people who demented and people who hadn't. And when we matched them for ageing, so took ageing out of the equation, the only real thing that we could find or only major effect was the apolipoprotein E4, which we already knew about. There were a few other genetic um, effects, interestingly very close to ApoE4, in, the, in, the, in our DNA, that also had a bit of a major effect. But from there, um, and the red is risk and blue is protective, from there, all the others had very, very small effects. And so we weren't really able to find any smoking gun, for want of a better word, uh, from this particular study. There were some interesting things, a protective effect of insomnia that um, is quite a controversial uh, thing. But also we saw some liver um, enzymes that seemed that they were increased or at least a ratio of them were increased could be problematic. Again, this is this idea that maybe some of these brain-only or what we think are brain-only diseases do affect other organs in the body. And there is something called the brain-liver-gut microbiome uh, axis uh, that might be consistent with this idea that liver is involved in some of these um, uh, neurodegenerative diseases. What about alcohol? Is that a risk factor for dementia? Well, heavy cons consumption of alcohol throughout your life, and I mean very heavy, like 100 grams a day, which would be equivalent to sort of eight cans of beer or, or more than a bottle of wine, that can be problematic. It would be also problematic for every other organ in your body. But in general, if you're a light drinker of alcohol, it seems to have what we call a J-curve effect on most of the organs in the body, where a little bit of alcohol compared with people who are staying completely, as it seems to have a positive effect on your cognition. But once you start drinking a lot more, then things go in the opposite direction. There's a condition that we also study called alcohol-related brain damage and people develop cognitive dysfunction. Some other people call it alcoholic de dementia. But whether alcohol increases your risk for Alzheimer's disease, if it does, it's probably um, only has a, has a small effect. So in general, alcohol is not um, a big problem for dementia per se, but drinking lots of alcohol is problematic for just about every other um, organ in your body, including your brain but not directly related to Alzheimer's disease. So what, are the, what is on the horizon for a cure or a treatment for Alzheimer's disease? Well, interestingly, some uh, types of drugs called amyloid modifying drugs based on antibodies which bind to and seemingly remove amyloid from the brain, they have been uh, recently, in 2020, and again, uh, just at the end of last year, these two drugs have now been approved by the FDA to be used in patients. It's a very controversial decision because even though we can see from imaging or a type of imaging called PET imaging that these people lose um, their amyloid in their brain, both drugs have only resulted in modest improvements in cognitive decline. Both drugs are very expensive. And so a lot of neuro neurologists are loathe to put people on these very expensive drugs if they're not going to have much um, improvement on their, on their cognition. I think most people would agree whether they're in the amyloid modifying drug camp or not, that adjunctive treatments are required. And to have it, new treatments, you need new targets. And this is a lot, this is the type of stuff that my lab work on. So how do we go about doing that? Well, very quickly, we're using two techniques that have been developed over the last couple of years. One's called single cell studies, where we isolate cells from people with the disease and people without it. 
dissociating out their brain tissue after their death and then working out whether the cells in people with the disease or not are expressing the same type of proteins. And what we found with this work among and others too is that there are actually lots of different types of oligodendrocytes or different types of astrocytes. And the size of the clusters and all the existence of some of these subclusters of these different brain cells are different, whether you've got the disease or you haven't got the disease. And so what we think happens is that the brain cell types change in people with a particular disease. And by looking at those patterns, we think we can find new um, targets for new therapies. A technique that's very similar to that is called spatial transcript transcriptomics. But this time, rather than breaking the brain up to get the information in terms of single cells, we leave the brain tissue as it is, photograph it, and then do the transcriptomics. So then we can relate what's happening um, in terms of gene expression directly to what's happening in the tissue, including whether there is pathology in that tissue or, or not. These are some uh, mouse tissue samples. They're not human, but it gives you an idea of this new, new approach. And this is something that we're really excited about because I think this is going to be um, revolutionary in terms of our understanding of brain diseases and, in fact, all diseases. So as a summary, there's two major killers that are, that are primarily regarded as, as brain diseases in Australia, and that's dementia and stroke. Your stroke risk is very similar to your risk of heart disease and other vascular diseases. And so trying to reduce the chance of that happening is very much along the lines of don't smoke, control high blood pressure, control bad cholesterol with things like statins increase your level of physical activity. Dementia is different. Most dementia is Alzheimer's disease. And the two major risk factors for Alzheimer's disease are non-modifiable. It's your age and the genetics that you're born with. And in particular, a gene variant called ApoE4. But there's also a vascular component, and although that varies from person to person. But So stroke avoidant measures or measures to avoid heart disease, like I mentioned just above, are going to be useful at warding off uh, dementia in a lot of individuals. So they shouldn't be underestimated. What about cognitive reserve? What about this idea of use it or lose it? Use your brain or lose your cognition? There is some truth in that, and it probably emanates from the fact that people who have uh, higher education have maybe developed their brain to a greater extent where, where it can withstand more pathology before the signs of dementia show. But there's no really clear evidence or at least any evidence that you can, you can stop dementia um, if you have those other modifiable uh, risk factors. And it seems, just to, to, to put this in context, that physical activity is probably doing more for you than the mental activity. Um, but it's all a little bit relative. What else? Well, that's what we're looking for um, in our lab and a lot of labs around the, around the world. Our own lab uses human brain tissue, and we're also lucky at the... University of Sydney and in the Charles Perkins Centre to have a brain bank. This brain bank collects um, tissue from after people have, have died. And you might not be aware that that is a possibility, but you can donate your tissue to support um, research into brain diseases. So just lastly, if you're interested in the, this work and particularly interested in uh, becoming a brain donor, um, please get in contact with me or my staff at some of these resources. Um, it's a great gift and it's making a lot of difference uh, in the way we do research and um, for future people and their risk of developing some of these um, terrible diseases. I thank you and I look forward to hearing your questions in the next part of this webinar.
Thank you so much, Greg. Great to have you here. Um, we've got quite a few questions here, um, so let's get straight into it. Um, our first few questions are about research. Um, so Linda asks, apart from a brain autopsy, is there any way to determine if someone has or has had dementia with Lewy bodies? Yeah, um, dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies is, um, is a disease that's quite similar to, um, to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and in that way, uh, there will be uh, similar findings on, on imaging and also uh, some new blood-based biomarkers. Um, whether you could tell clinically that someone had DLB from Alzheimer's with uh, any degree of confidence, it's, it's, it's hard to say. There are a couple of clinical um, uh, things that happen with uh, DLB, such as uh, visual hallucinations, which don't, necess don't often happen with people with Alzheimer's disease. I think the other thing with dementia is Lewy bodies is that mm. uh, the Lewy bodies give the clue away that these people often have uh, motor symptoms associated with Parkinson's disease. And a, and a rule of thumb is that if you develop dementia within one year of your diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, then it's likely to be dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, the, the variation on that theme is if you don't develop dementia, but you do develop eventually, uh, they use the term Parkinson's disease and dementia or Parkinson's disease dementia. Um, so we're getting better. We're getting better at differentiating between those diseases, but there's no, no real uh, diagnostic test at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and with that uh, research into blood tests, um, once they become available for clinicians, just to clarify, they'll be able to tell the difference between Alzheimer's disease and Lewy body disease, or are they just blood tests for dementia in general? Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I, th I think in terms of um, sensitivity, they they've got some good tests, uh, blood biomarkers that will pick out Alzheimer's disease. So by exclusion, if you've got a very similar disease to Alzheimer's and you have the general um, blood markers of a neurodegenerative process, uh, then um, you would probably have one of the other two common types of dementia, uh, being vascular dementia or dementia with Lewy bodies. So um, there is a good chance you'd have it, but, uh, but I'm not aware that there is any um, either cut off with those general markers or specific markers for dementia with Lewy bodies at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and another question from an anonymous attendee is um, how much research has been done into cohorts of society where dementia is more common? For example, people living with Down syndrome. Uh, um, yes, uh, qu quite a quite a lot. Um, w w and, and within the with with some of the ethical constraints associated with the with the Down syndrome community, but so. It's an interesting question because people with Down syndrome have three copies or trisome, three copies of chromosome 21. And the gene, uh, well, the amyloid precursor protein, which is cut up to produce the amyloid in our, in our brains, uh, both normally and, and unfortunately abnormally, that sits on chromosome 21. So for people with Down syndrome, they inherit three copies. And that's the inheriting those three copies in excess of the precursor protein that seems to lead to their Alzheimer's disease. Almost everyone with Down syndrome develops Alzheimer's disease and they tend to develop by about the fourth decade. So it's quite a bit quicker than, than other, other people. Mm. Um, so Down syndrome is, is one of the, the key bits of evidence that there is a genetic of, of genetics in, in Alzheimer's disease and um, really people started from the knowing about, about, about Down syndrome and the trisomy 21, they started looking for gene um, duplications in people with Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, they, they eventually did find some, but what they found first were different types of mutations called missense mutations. And they were found in the, in, in the early 90s. So 
work done on on Down syndrome was actually critical of, of, of starting this and, and work continues. Obviously, um, it's very problematic for persons with Down syndrome or living with Down syndrome uh, dementia. So you know, they should benefit uh, from similar uh, treatments that uh, benefit the, the greater sporadic Alzheimer's disease community, I would imagine. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so a few questions about comorbid comorbidities. Um, ben asked, um, uh, he saw that they saw that you put trauma on the possible causes of brain disease. Um, and they were just wondering, um, are concussions able to lead to dementia slash Alzheimer's? And if so, how bad is that? And how big of a risk factor is head trauma for Alzheimer's or dementia? So, so just in terms of Alzheimer's disease, it's actually a single um, traumatic in incident rather than this repetitive trauma or that we might associate with contact sports. That seems to be a risk factor for Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease. If you have concussion and multiple concussions, um, you can develop a very similar disease to Alzheimer's called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Alzheimer's disease and chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE both um, have built up of a protein called tau or fibrillar tau in the brains. But the, where the tau builds up is slightly different between the two diseases. CTE, you don't get the amyloid build up. So definitely multiple concussions, probably there's a genetic influence there too, People would lead to a, an Alzheimer's disease or like Alzheimer's disease, but not Alzheimer's disease itself. But there seems to be a risk associated with a traumatic brain injury where you've lost consciousness that seems to show up in studies to, to be a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Okay, great. Um, and another question from uh, Wasfi um, is if you're, you have treated hypertension, would hypertension still be a risk factor or is it reduced once it's treated? Look, uh, I, think the, uh, I think the simple way, uh, sim simplest way to describe that is, um, is what treatments going in, in control of your hypertension or regulated uh, blood, blood pressure uh, is going to reduce your risk. Um, immeasurably. Um, there are other other issues uh, that may, while it wasn't treated or while it's building up, uh, there could be issues with some of your cerebrovasculature or the, the blood vessels within your within your brain. They they may lose a little bit of the elasticity. But in general, if it's, it's if it's under control, and I think we're really good um, at picking up hypertension. When I say we, the general practitioners and that these days. So if, it, if it's controlled, it, it will be reducing your risk quite considerably. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, Crystal um, asks, and also Jessica asked about this as well. Um, is there a link between migraine and dementia and also particularly long-term migraine sufferers? Not, not that, not that I know of. Um, but it's a, but thanks for the question. It's a very interesting uh, question. Um, no, not, not that I know of. That I, I have never, I've never read that that, that that's the case. Uh, so um, I don't believe so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, that's good to hear um, for people living yeah. with migraine. Um, and. Another question from Alice is, um, what do you think about neuroplasticity and neurogenesis? Um, and she also kind of asked this in the context of um, uh, concussions and head injury. Sorry to go back to that, but um, yeah. yeah. Yes, well, I, I had a little bit um, to do with, with, with neurogenesis or neurogenesis studies a, a, a few years ago. Uh, we started looking at it because it was suggested that um, alcohol uh, could cause problems for the brain by depressing uh, neurogenesis. So neurogenesis is this idea, or at least adult neurogenesis, is this idea that new neurons uh, continue to be born through a, throughout your life. And they're born, born 
an odd term, but there's stem cells, neural stem cells within in your brain in two in two areas. And we we looked at that, and we didn't find any difference with people with alcoholism, but it also was becoming quite controversial what level of neurogenesis was was happening in the in the brain. So we actually looked at that over the lifespan of individuals from um, three months of age all the way up to 60, 60 years of age, I think, at the time. And what we found was that the neurogenesis uh, tailed off very um, abruptly around about three years of age and then continued to tail off from there. So our own feeling is that although neurogenesis does exist, it's more like a residual, almost vestigial process in the, in the adult brain. It's not to say it can't be reignited uh, if, if we understood how to do it. So the distinction between neurogenesis and neuroplasticity is neuroplasticity uh, is a much more uh, broader uh, situation and does happen in the brain. Um, so two, two aspects, myelination or the insulating um, fat that sits around our axons that develops um, as 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 we age, or well into our twenties and, and 30s. So that's one of the last processes. And then there's constant tinkering with the connections between neurons that we call sy synapses. Synapses can be removed; they can be strengthened, um, both on a structural level and also within the cells on a molecular level. So. There is neuroplasticity, neurogenesis, um, not so much in the adult brain, but we're still trying to work out how we could stimulate it. Mm, great, thank you. Um, so we've got a few um, questions here about um, general brain health. Um, yes. Tali asks, um, is there any evidence to suggest that fish oil supplements are beneficial for brain health? Um, and if so, is that because of the anti-inflammatory effect? Yeah, yeah. Um, fish, fish oil could have two could have two effects. It could be anti-inflammatories or, or antioxidants. Probably is more more the point. It, it's also a good source of what they call good good fats or, or non-trans uh, fats, which um, will will support the brain will requires um, uh, fatty fatty acids, although, and then tends to make the fats that it needs, including uh, myelin. But, you know, any source of fish oil and any other source of polyunsaturated fatty acids is all, always going to be good for, the, good for the brain. The exact relationships of what's happening at your gut level, what's being produced in your liver, and what reaches the brain and then what the brain is able to, to do with that still is a little bit um, un, unknown. Um, and it does get offset a little bit by aging and particularly uh, an aging liver. However, in general, it's um, those polyunsaturated fats and sources of them are, certainly would do no harm and are probably um, a good idea. Great. Um, Adrian asks, um, on the genetic side of things, um, she asks, it sounds like APOE4 people with the mutation, um, are, I guess, almost doomed to get Alzheimer's disease. Um, what's your opinion on that? Do you think that's true or what do you have to say? Yeah, look, um, it's it's pretty. Uh, I think it's important to to uh, make the distinction between apo so apoe four. So there's there's apoe four is a variant that around about eight eight well, at least eight percent yeah, but about twenty percent of the population carry that variant. It's not a mutation. So so mutations are in three other genes, and if you have those mutations, you will definitely develop the disease. If you have one copy of, of the variant APOE4, um, as opposed to the more common forms APOE3, uh, then your lifetime risk um, increases by about twofold. But if you do have two copies, then it, then it increases your lifetime risk at 10 times. So that means if you are a um, what we homozygote, or you have two copies of APOV4, then you've got about a 50% chance of developing Alzheimer's disease during your life. 
So, so similarly, you have a 50% chance of not developing it. Um, so I wouldn't say I wouldn't say people are doomed, and this is the sporadic form of the disease. So it is affecting people in their eighth decade, albeit if you are um, the, um, a homozygote for those for that period uh, for that genetic variant, it, it does bring your age of onset a little bit little bit closer. We we spend a lot of time thinking about how ApoE4, this this common variant, causes the disease and. Um, unfortunately, we just we still don't we still don't know. But there's there's many theories that I could go into if, some, if someone's interested. So, fifty percent in your lifetime, but fifty percent of people won't get it. And similarly, if you don't have ApoE4, even though your risk of getting Alzheimer's decreases, um, you can still get the disease. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Um, and also with this new research around um, genetic testing and what we're learning about um, the genetic factors of Alzheimer's disease, um, an anonymous attendee asked, um, do you recommend elderly people or, or anyone really to have a test for um, that gene? Like, put, for example, every few years or something, how, how would that work clinically? I think... Um, and I'm not, you know, I, I've got to be a little bit careful here giving um, clinical advice as a, I am a, a scientist, uh, but I think most people would recommend that if you have a very strong family history of the disease, uh, let's take, for example, Alzheimer's disease, you have a number of first degree relatives or sibling, etc then you probably should go and, and get some genetic testing or at least go to a genetic counsellor. And that, that testing would be done on the, the genes, uh, including amyloid precursor protein gene, APP, and two others. When it, when it comes to ApoE4 and, and, and testing, and I, I know there was a actor who, uh, an Australian actor who did this recently um, and found out that he was... Um, had two copies of the ApoE4. I don't know at the moment if we could do anything with that information. So I would advise people not to not to do that. The variation on that theme is that there have been people put into trials who are ApoE4 homozygotes, so they have two copies uh, for the amyloid uh, modifying drugs. Um, so there there are reasons why you might want to know, but in general. If you, that information probably won't help you and may just lead you uh, to having worrying, to worrying. One other thing I should say is your genetics, you have them for life. So if you were to find out you were APOE, uh, a homozygote for APOE4 at, uh, at 20, you would still be at 80 years of age. So it's not something you'd have to continue to do. Um, your ge genetics are permanent and immutable in, in, in just about every situation. So... Definitely not having to go for a test after test. Okay. Um, and um, Viv asked, um, in, in general with brain health, um, what about uh, general anaesthetics? Because um, it seems that um, many people are concerned about how general anaesthetics affect their brain health. Good. Um, there is... There is something called uh, well, you know, brain brain fog, although we we use that term or this um, transient dementia that in certain elderly people. When I, I make the point, elderly, um, say in the seventies, at least seventies, where they do develop a, a dementia, um, it tends to be transient as far as far as I know. Um, but but it is a it is a known it is a known thing now. What that that mechanism would be, I I think we would all be guessing, and and I wouldn't hazard a guess at the moment. I don't know enough about it. I mean, if you then compare that with the amount of general anaesthetics that happen um, on a on a daily basis, then I think the risk is, is 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 minimal compared with that. But yes, it's it's certainly something that uh, is does happen. It often has a transient effect, and people do re recover their cognitive function. Um, but it's something that we we are interested in. But I would not know what the mechanism would be. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, another question, um, Steve um, asks, are there epigenetic factors that are relevant to dementias? Yeah, simple, simple uh, answer there is, is yes. And it, it, just to, to clarify what, what Steve will be referring to, this is the, the idea that um, there's some changes to, to your genetics that aren't heritable, they're sort of non-heritable changes. And so there can be, um, there's two types, um, it doesn't really matter going, going into them, but it, it appears that for, for cells like, like neurons, they can accumulate over the life of the person, these epigenetic changes, to, which will affect gene expression patterns. Um, I talked about transcriptomics, which is looking at gene, gene expression, but there's no other experiments that you can do to actually, in, in brain tissue or in the blood, where you can look for epigenetic changes. And there's certainly evidence that there's, there are these, these changes associated with the disease. It's not my um, it's not my forte, but there's, there's no doubt that they that they are important. Um, epi, epigenetics uh, it's it's a it's a natural it's a natural process. It's a way that we can turn on and turn off uh, genes at different times of our of our lifespan, particularly the embryological level. Uh, so. Working out what's what's normal from what's abnormal is always a always a challenge. But yes, it's it certainly is part of the part of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, and we've also got two questions here: one from an anonymous attendee and one from Angie, um, asking um, about COVID and um, possible links to dementia. Um, Angie asked specifically um, if there are any links between people who have had long COVID or significant long-term brain fog as well. Yeah, yeah, thank you really for that question. And of course, if, anything that's COVID related is is, is sort of just uh, um, come across our, our desk, so to, so to speak. It seems like the, we, we talk about the direction of causation in, in these diseases, and it seems actually the other way around, that if you were higher risk of, of the people with dementia or a higher risk of COVID-related mortality. Um, moving back in the direction where the COVID's bad for, for dementia, I, I did read a, a paper the other day talking about, yes, it is a risk factor, but not because the COVID virus or the SARS-CoV-2 virus gets into the brain. It actually They actually think it's more from the respiratory point of view. Um, and uh, relates to hypoxia, so just not as much oxygen uh, reaching the, reaching the brain um, and contributing to to the dementia uh, that way. Long term brain fog uh, or long COVID uh, with associated co cognition um, deficits. I, we just don't know enough about it at the moment, but you know it's certainly it's certainly worrying. Um, there has been a um, there has been a mouse model uh, where they had been deliberately infected with COVID nineteen, and they showed that they could increase the amount of amyloid. So it's certainly something that we are looking at. But as I say at the moment, they do think that that is um, as a result of, of the hypoxia rather than the virus actually getting into the brain. Okay, great, um, and just. Really, while well, we're right up to the hour, um, if we can squeeze in one quick question um, from Rose, um, asking how do people plan for their health needs if they're at risk? Um, do you have any advice or thoughts on that? I think the only the only people that are really really at risk, and this is a very rare, uh, these are a very small part of the population, and less than one percent of those that actually carry a mutation. Even if you are homozygous for the, the, the two copies of APOE, um, your I said as you as I said your lifetime risk is is fifty percent, but it's only going to affect you in your in your in your eighties now. So I, I would really say to, to young young people or people up in the middle age and even into their sixties and seventies, I, I wouldn't be worrying worrying about that. I mean, other other than that. 
the best the best advice is that you know by by remaining physically active not smoking and drinking all of those advice of of good vascular um health and including including diet like the mediterranean uh, diet these are i mean these are all going to reduce your chance of dementia because for the card carrying dementia sufferer uh they're going to have uh, a component of Alzheimer's disease causing their cognitive decline, but also a component of vascular dementia. So reducing your chance of that is going to um, prolong uh, your cognitive um, function. There is these treatments on the horizon in Australia that have been approved in the United States. I mean, in some ways, and disappointingly, that you know we're talking in levels of say twenty seven percent is of reduction in cognitive de decline over the period that the people were on the trial. So they're not massive effects. So we really do need other, other treatments and that's probably what we're working on. So we our advice at the moment is the same sort of advice for you know, a healthy, healthy body really, um, not, not smoking, exercising and, and, and good, good food. But um, other than that, even if you did have uh, these genetic variants that increase your risk of Alzheimer's disease, I wouldn't be worrying too much too much about that. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Greg. Um, and thank you everyone for your questions. Um, sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. Um, we had a lot of fantastic questions tonight. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. And we hope everyone um, has a fantastic Brain Awareness Week. Thanks for joining us.